How many of you here today own a cell phone? Raise your hands. How many of you do not own a cell phone? Raise your hands. More than I thought. Do you know the story about the monkey in the jar of peanuts? The monkey puts his hands in the jar and grabs a fistful of peanuts. He doesn't realize that if he only opens his fist and lets go of the peanuts, his hand will come out easily. But then he wouldn't get the peanuts, so he holds on. He never gets to eat the peanuts, and his fist is stuck in the jar forever. The peanuts are cell phones. Most people on this planet have a jar of peanuts with their fist in the jar, and they won't let go. If they think about it at all, they want the cell towers to go away. They don't want 5G. They don't want 20,000 satellites in the sky. They don't want to be irradiated, but they won't take their hand out of that jar. It doesn't occur to them that once, not too long ago, there were no peanuts in the jar and there were no cell towers and they did not forget their words and their friends did not have cancer and heart disease and diabetes and their children did not have ADHD or autism and flowers were full of butterflies and bees. If you hold a cell phone in your hand against your head your brain is getting 100,000 times more radiation from the cell phone than it probably gets from the nearest cell tower. If you put the cell tower on a table three feet away, you're only getting 10 times more radiation from the cell tower than you're getting from the cell, from the cell phone than you're getting from the cell tower. In order for you to ha own a cell phone, that tower has to be there. In order for you to make a cell phone call, that tower has to open up a dedicated channel just for you, and it has to irradiate the entire countryside just so you can make that call and irradiate not only your own brain, but everyone around you. Those of you who own cell phones, do you ever wonder when you're on your phone who you are irradiating, who you are torturing, in order for you to answer a call on your phone, that cell tower has to open up a dedicated channel just for you and irradiate the countryside and all the people and birds and animals and trees and insects just so you can answer that call. And if you want to be able to use your cell phone in emergencies and remote locations, there have to be cell towers absolutely everywhere. And if you want to be able to connect to the internet with your cell phone, and everybody in the world wants to connect to the internet with their cell phone, the existing towers don't have enough capacity, so they have to build more of them. The more devices there are in the internet, the more towers. As we progress from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G, we also progress from having a cell tower on a mountaintop 90 miles away to having a cell tower on a lamppost outside your bedroom window. 1G is what we had in the 1980s and until 1996. The phones were large, not many people had them, and the cell towers were few and very far between mostly around metropolitan areas. The few people who used cell phones lost many brain cells and some got brain cancer. But the general population was not much affected. Analog signals are smooth sine waves, continuous waves. Each frequency can only serve a single cell phone user. 2G is digital. Digital means pulsed. Everything is encoded into zeros and ones. 2G came to the US in late 1996. The telecommunications industry wanted to put a cell phone 
into the hands of every man, woman, and child on Earth. And in order to do that, they needed a much denser network of cell towers. And they needed them everywhere, not just in metropolitan areas, but in small towns, forests, wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and national parks. They sold these phones as being necessary for emergencies. And they could not sell them unless they could assure people they would work wherever they lived and wherever they traveled. 2G was digital for two reasons. First, each frequency could be used simultaneously by many users. They could divide a single frequency into time slots, one time slot per user instead of one frequency per user. Or they could assign a different digital code to different users of the same frequency. So they didn't need quite so many towers if they were digital. Second, they wanted all cell phones to be able to save and store information that could be downloaded onto a computer. 2G caused enormous health problems. It injured millions. It caused the influenza epidemic of 1996 through 1997. It killed at least 10,000 in the United States in a matter of months, according to statistics from the Centers for Disease Control. I am a refugee from 2G technology. Some people say that pulse signals are more harmful than continuous waves. That's not always true. They both cause cancer and diabetes, as far as we know, equally. Continuous waves cause worse damage to the blood-brain barrier than pulsed signals. Pulse signals are more damaging to the heart and the nervous system. It depends on which effects you are looking at. 3G came to the US in 2004. 3G were the first smartphones. Now you could send text messages and you could get onto the internet with your phone. Cell phones were now little computers. 3G needed a lot more towers. 4G added still more capabilities. It was much faster. You could stream video on your phone. 4G needed to be much faster because 3G was slowing way down due to the constantly increasing traffic and the increasing number of users. 4G required still more towers. Each upgrade in service injured additional people, killed additional people, and created additional refugees who can no longer live in society. 5G will still be digital, but it will be radically different in a number of ways. Necessarily so, because there is no way to connect a trillion separate objects to the Internet, which is what the Internet of Things is all about. There is no way to do that with traditional cell towers and with the frequencies currently in use. There simply is not enough bandwidth. If you understand that bandwidth means radiation, then you can begin to grasp the enormity of 5G. At millimeter wave frequencies, a wireless company will be able to own five gigahertz of continuous electromagnetic spectrum. But even that much spectrum, even that much radiation cannot connect a trillion separate devices unless cell towers and cell phones are completely redesigned 5G is being created because of consumer demand. Too many devices are being connected up to the internet. Devices in homes, businesses, and automobiles. Everyone is using their devices at all hours of the day. 4G is slowing way down. And the wireless in industry is projecting into the future and building a robust network that will accommodate 100 billion devices, or even 1 trillion devices, all operating simultaneously. The new network will use something called phased arrays. That means your cell phone will have within it an array of dozens of antennas, all working together to shoot 
a powerful laser-like beam at the nearest cell tower. And instead of having three, six, or nine antennas broadcasting in all directions, the cell tower will have an array of hundreds or thousands of millimeter-sized antennas, all working together to shoot multiple individual laser-like beams at you and everyone else who is holding a cell phone and the beams which will have an effective radiated power of up to 100,000 watts or more will track you wherever you go. Needless to say, birds that get in the way of these beams will be in trouble. So will insects, which are millimeter-sized creatures that will resonate and selectively absorb the millimeter frequencies that will be used for 5G. At least 20 million people in the world, and I estimate that conservatively, have already been injured by cell phones and their infrastructure so severely that they cannot work, they are driven out of their homes and their cities, and they cannot live in society. They are environmental refugees, and they are in every country. Many are housebound and never venture outside. It's not just because of cell towers and Wi-Fi, it's because every person in the world has a cell phone. They never go out in society to avoid being tortured whenever someone pulls out a phone and makes a call or sends a text or takes a picture or even sits near them with a phone in their pocket because cell phones radiate even when they are off as long as the battery is in them. Many of these people are homeless, living in cars and tents in remote places, committing suicide, and no one comes to their aid. Many are your friends and neighbors, your doctors, your children's teachers. Many more are your former friends and neighbors, your former doctors, your children's former teachers, perhaps your ex-spouse, your mother or father or son or daughter or cousin. These are the people who are called wrongly electrically sensitive just as the people who have been poisoned by the millions of petrochemicals that have rained down on our world since World War II are called wrongly chemically sensitive. Electrical sensitivity is not a disease. It is not a medical term. It is a purely political term. It is a term that allows everyone who uses a cell phone or a wireless computer to pretend that these devices are not poisoning them and that the people who have woken up to the truth, who have not only woken up to the truth but who dare to speak the truth, it is a term that allows everyone who is still in denial to pretend that such people are abnormal and less than human. It is a term that allows the purveyors of these devices to sell them with a clear conscience to pretend that they are not committing a crime against all humanity. It is a term that allows people to pretend that their own poor memory and inability to sleep, or their high blood pressure, or their multiple sclerosis, have nothing to do with their own cell phone and their wireless router. It is a term that allows the screams of the people who have not only managed to figure out what is killing them, but who dare to insist that this is not okay, that this is not normal, that this must stop. It is a term that allows their screams on behalf of themselves and their beautiful planet to be ignored. It is a term that allows everyone who has opened up their eyes to what has actually happen, happening to be treated as though they are still blind instead of being listened to. It is a term that allows doctors to prescribe anti-anxiety medications, antidepressants, and sleeping pills instead of telling their patients to get rid of their Wi-Fi and throw away their cell phones. It is a term that allows people to undergo hip replacements instead of keeping their cell phone out of their pocket, to undergo heart transplants instead of throwing away their wireless devices. Because of cell phones, 
the worst humanitarian crisis on the planet is occurring right now and for the past 20 years in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There is a rare earth mineral in your cell phone called tantalum that is extracted from an ore called coltan. The vast majority of the world's coltan is located in eastern Congo. A lot of that coltan is being mined by hand by child slaves in the Ituri province of the Congo, where the rainforest is being cleared, the eastern lowland gorilla, which is the world's largest gorilla subspecies, is being driven to extinction. Ethnic cleansing is wiping out all the villages of that province. The Mbuti pygmies, who used to inhabit the Ituri rainforest that used to exist, are being slaughtered, all to clear an immense area of land in order to mine more and more and more and more coltan for the billions of throwaway devices that you are holding in your hands that become obsolete and must be replaced virtually every year. An estimated two million people in Eastern Congo, many of them children, many of them virtual or actual slaves, are mining coltan by hand under appalling conditions to be shipped to processing plants in China and East Asia before winding up in your cell phone. The conflict in Congo is being called a civil war by the media. It is not. It is a war for control over the world's most prized mineral deposits. An estimated 5.4 million people died in the first decade of the war over coltan. No one knows how many have died in the second decade. The cause of all of this havoc and destruction is the cell phone. If you want instant communication and information at your fingertips at all times, you're going to des destroy the earth. As soon as you buy a cell phone and register it with a service provider, that provider is required by law to put up enough towers to serve you wherever you live and wherever you travel. The more often you go on the internet and the more devices you own that go on the internet, the more towers your service provider has to erect until it eventually runs out of spectrum and has to go to the FCC and ask for more spectrum in order to serve you. And as soon as the FCC auctions off new spectrum, the companies that buy the new spectrum are required by law to put up enough towers and antennas to make use of it. And that is where we are today. The FCC plans to auction off millimeter wave spectrum on November 14th, 2018. And in order to make use of that millimeter wave spectrum, your service provider will have to put up antennas on a pole outside your bedroom window. 5G is just an intensification of the destruction that has been going on for 22 years. The microwave devices that you carry in your hands will be much more powerful. The antennas in the streets and in your children's playgrounds and in the steeples of your churches will multiply tenfold, a hundredfold. The birds and insects of this world will be replaced by laser-like beams whizzing by at all times. Instead of every second man and every third woman developing cancer, we will all develop cancer. We will all develop diabetes. Contrary to what some people are saying, the solution is not fiber optic cable. Many people would like to think that if we only connected up every house and every business in the world to fiber optic cable, we could all have super fast internet without wireless. What people do not know is that the wireless industry itself is right now spending $150 billion laying fiber optic cable absolutely everywhere on the planet. It is the only way they are going to have fast enough speeds for 5G. They have to shoot lasers all over the planet through fiber optic cable in order to shoot laser-like beams all over the planet through the air. Once high-speed fiber optic trunks are laid everywhere, they're going to stick millions of antennas into that cable and broadcast 5G. 
They want to tear out all existing copper wire, all existing coaxial cable, and all the old lower speed fiber optic cable and replace it all with super high speed fiber optic trunks that they can stick antennas into. If you advocate for high speed fiber, you're advocating for 5G. Some people are saying Li-Fi will be the solution. Instead of dangerous microwaves, we can use safe, ordinary light. I have news for them. Li-Fi will be worse. It will not be ordinary light. It will be digital, pulsed light. Pulsed at the same frequencies that are destroying our world. They are brainwave frequencies. They are frequencies of nervous impulses. They are frequencies of our organs and our cells. And we will absorb them much more efficiently if the carrier wave is light than, the carrier, than if the carrier wave is microwaves. We did not evolve with microwaves. Microwaves are foreign to us. Our bodies reject them. Light, however, is a necessary nutrient. The blood in our veins is blue, and then our arteries is red because we absorb red and blue light, as well as the colors in between. Li-Fi will des destroy us from within like a Trojan horse. So far, I have only been talking about what's happening on the ground. <clears throat> the third generation partnership project released, that's a worldwide organization that sets the standard for all wireless technology. It released technical specifications for 5G in June 2018. They include not only specifications for 5G on the ground, but specifications for 5G satellites in space. And the fleets of 5G satellites will be enormous. The FCC and the International Telecommunication Union have already approved some of these projects. A company called Worldview, Worldview is preparing to launch a fleet of 4,500 and 40 satellites into low and medium orbit around the Earth in order to provide high speed, low latency internet to every square inch of the planet. The partners and investors and customers of this project already include Airbus, Amazon, Virgin Galactic, Qualcomm, Hughes Network Systems, Intelsat of Luxembourg, Marker LLC of Israel, Grupo Salinas of Mexico, SoftBank of Japan, Bharti Enterprises of India, Coca-Cola, and Honeywell. Elon Musk's company, SpaceX, is preparing to launch 12,000 satellites into low orbit to do the same thing. Each satellite will have thousands of millimeter-sized antennas on board, all arranged in a phased array, all working together to focus narrow beams of energy at the ground all over the planet. Each beam from each satellite will have an effective radiated power of up to 5 million watts. Boeing already has permission to launch 2,956 such satellites into low orbit. Nobody is stopping to ask what this will do to Earth and every living thing on Earth. I'm not even talking about the effects of rocket exhaust from thousands of rocket launches on the ozone layer and on the Earth's climate, which will be significant and perhaps catastrophic. I'm talking about the alteration of the electromagnetic environment of the entire planet. What effect will 20,000 satellites, each one emitting beams as powerful as 5 million watts, into the Earth's magnetosphere what effect will that have on life on the surface of our fragile planet? I have been monitoring the effects of low orbit communication satellites ever since the first ones began service in 1998. On September 23, 1998, the 66 satellites launched into low orbit by the Iridium Corporation 
began commercial service to the world's first satellite phones. People from all over the world reported to me that beginning early in the morning on September 23rd, it felt like a knife went through the back of their head, or they had stabbing pains in their chest, or they had sudden onset of headaches, dizziness, nausea, nosebleeds, asthma attacks. That was 66 satellites. What will 20,000 do? Electromagnetic energy is invisible. So people ignore it. But it is all around us, and in us, and through us, and it is the basis of life. The atmospheric electric field, the electric field in which we all live and work and function, has an average value of 130 volts per meter. There is a small but constant electric current coming down from the sky into the earth at all times that flows through every living thing. That electric current enters the top of every tree, flows down through the sap and into the earth through the roots. That electric current enters the tops of our heads, flows down through our acupuncture meridians and into the earth through the soles of our feet. It is what gives us life, maintains our health, and regulates our biological rhythms. That current is part of the global electrical circuit that atmospheric physicists study. The electric current courses through the ionosphere above us, flows gently down through the atmosphere to the earth in fair weather, courses through the earth beneath our feet and flows violently back up to the sky during thunderstorms. We pollute the global electrical circuit at our peril. Nobody is stopping to ask what 20,000 satellites located directly in the ionosphere, each one emitting digital pulsed millimeter wave radiation of up to 5 million watts, nobody is stopping to ask what that will do to every living thing below. We are working on these problems, and by we I mean I and cooperation with other people throughout the world, and in New Mexico, and in the United States. We are working on these problems at the national and international levels. Here in New Mexico, we are going to file a lawsuit in Santa Fe shortly, asking a judge to declare that any law passed by city, state, or federal government that deprives injured people of any remedy for their injuries, we're going to ask the court to declare such laws unconstitutional. That includes, specifically, an ordinance that was passed by the Santa Fe City Council one year ago which says that antennas in the public rights of way within the city of Santa Fe are no longer subject to land use review. A law that was signed by Governor Martinez in March and is scheduled to go into effect on September 1st, which says that antennas in the public rights of way anywhere in New Mexico are no longer subject to land use review. And we're going to challenge Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which for the past 22 years has deprived injured people of any right to protest cell towers on the basis of health or to collect any damages if they are injured. This lawsuit has the potential for setting a nationwide precedent in a short amount of time, provided we raise enough money to pay for experts and lawyers. Please contact me afterwards or call me or email me if you want to help. We have a lawyer who gets how huge this lawsuit is, who is drafting the complaint right now and who wants to file it by the end of August. An international appeal to stop 5G on Earth and in space has been drafted. 
and will be released hopefully this week. I have been helping with that effort. Our goal is to get thousands of signatures of scientists, doctors, and environmental organizations all over the world and to formally present the appeal in many languages to the governments of all nations by the end of September 2018. Also contact me afterwards or call me or email me later if you want to help with that project. My phone number and email address are on the handouts that I will give you. All of these efforts, our efforts here in New Mexico, lobbying efforts in Congress and in state legislatures around the country, class action lawsuits that are being filed in Canada and Australia, and the international appeal that we will present to every government. All of these efforts depend on the public. The telecommunications industry is the largest industry on the planet. No legislator, no judge, and no government official will risk damaging this industry and threatening the world economy unless the public rises up and lets them know that we do not want these products and services anymore. None of these efforts can succeed unless the monkey opens his fist. If you want to save yourselves and your neighbors and your children and all the birds and the bees and the butterflies and the frogs and the bats and the trees and the lowland gorillas and the pygmies and the villagers of Ituri province in the Congo, you have to throw away your cell phone. There is no more time for excuses. It has to start here and it has to start now and it has to spread from here throughout the world. I am distributing three articles that go into more detail about some of the things I have been talking about today. Let me pause for a minute and I'll give you the three handouts and you can pass them out. Thank you for the help. The first handout is cell phones, questions and answers. And is all about your cell phone. The second is titled From Blankets to Bullets and is all about 5G. The third is titled Planetary Emergency and is about 5G from space. I also have for sale a couple I brought 16 copies of my book, The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life, which people can buy from me afterwards. It can also be ordered on my website, cellphonetaskforce.org. This book puts everything I have been saying into context and explains how we came to be in the fix that we are in today. It is a story that begins in the year 1746. Chapter 5 is about chronic electrical illness, otherwise known as anxiety disorder. Chapters 7 and 8 are about acute electrical illness, otherwise known as influenza. Chapter 11 is about heart disease. Chapter 12 is about diabetes. Chapter 13 is about cancer. Chapter 16 is about the birds and the bees and the forests. All of the proceeds from sales of my book are being spent on the effort to stop 5G. I will now stop and invite questions.